A short video clip there, of course, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, something different, of course, uh, today. So anyway, uh, welcome you back, of course, Daniel Simon uh, at Baton Rouge Community College. We, we, we had a great weekend uh, overall, uh, of course. Going, I guess, into the second half, of course, of the semester, of course, at BRCC uh, for this history 11-23 class. So uh, we had a great, great time over the weekend. Uh, we had a great LSU game, of course, saw that was pretty good. Uh, of course, over the weekend. But anyway, um, so, yeah, it looks like I got a bunch of students watching live. I know right now that just came in. I know Lulu's watching. Good morning. Uh, also, hey, Josh, what's up? What's going on this morning? Uh, and then, of course, Brianna, good morning. And it looks like Brittany and also Samari are also joining us uh, this morning as well. Uh, so, yeah, I know it's midterms this week. I know at BRCC, of course, I, I'm not doing a midterm exam, of course, for my classes. I don't usually do that, but uh, I am giving, I know, mid midterm makeups this week, uh, of course, uh, which I, I, I did send emails out about that yesterday. Uh, so if there's a, some kind of assignment that you, you didn't complete for some reason, uh, I am going to give you like a makeup period, of course, during the week to kind of uh, make up some grades, whatever you've missed in the semester. So you, or if you did everything already in the semester, you don't have to worry about that, of course, email uh, overall. So anyway, uh, uh, before I get started, I did want to remind you about uh, assignments. I am keeping open uh, assignments, I think, throughout most of the week. I know during the midterm, uh, but I know we've got the first exam uh, for y'all to wrap up this week uh, and get that out the way uh, on the age of absolutism. So that's the one thing y'all should be working on right now. Uh, of course, second vocab, if you those have not turned that in, uh, I think I'll have it open until Friday uh, for you to get those turned in. Uh, of course, the other assignments, of course, first exam bonus quiz. I think I'll leave that one open, I think, during midterms. And then the British quiz, I'm not sure when that'll be due. Uh, probably going to give you a few more days on it until probably next week, uh, I think. So uh, anyway, uh, this week, of course, I will continue uh, talking about the period of the French Revolution course. Uh, of course, one of the main things we'll get to today, uh, we'll talk about Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, how he comes in uh, at the end of the French Revolution, uh, takes over not just France, but a good chunk of Europe uh, that he controls uh, for a while. Uh, I'll talk about the age of Napoleon. I'll kind of get in, of course, talk a lot about the Napoleonic Wars, which is really one of the most bloodiest conflicts that happened uh, in the 19th century. Uh, later in the week, I'll also continue talking about uh, the 19th century as well. So if you have any comments, questions for the live stream, you can, of course, leave me a comment, of course, uh, today or on my channel. Uh, also, you can leave comments, of course, uh, I think in Canvas discussions as well. So anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I want to get, of course, into talking about this new period that's kind of like early part of the really early part of the 19th century, uh, which it will be, which, of course, is the age of Napoleon, which they often nickname it, uh, which Napoleon, you know, influenced a lot in Europe, uh, not not just because of like his military, you know, influences and all that. But uh, Napoleon was a pretty good statesman. Uh, of course, he had the Napoleonic Code uh, you probably heard of. Uh, also as well. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about Napoleon. Napoleon was this man that was not just a general, like I said, a military you know, mind, uh, but he also uh, was a political leader and later also a monarch because he was you know, emperor of France uh, for, I think, roughly around 10 years. So let's talk about Napoleon, like a little background about his life. I'll kind of go into like the early life of Napoleon and who Napoleon was uh, pretty much. Uh, Napoleon um, was originally born in Corsica. So if you know about Napoleon, he had an um, Italian background, uh, you know, of Italian descent. And you see down there, that's kind of how they think uh, Napoleon's name was spelled in Italian, Bonaparte, I think is maybe how they said it uh, originally. Uh, and uh, so Napoleon uh, came from there. Uh, and I think I've got some images uh, showing you uh, kind of some of the background, like the rise of Napoleon right there. So born on the island of Corsica, uh, 1769, uh, came from an aristocratic background, but more like lower aristocrat, uh, they think. Uh, and then he was sent later to military schools in France, uh, where he rapidly 
advance, you know, through uh, the French army, which a lot of it had to do with the French Revolution of more, more than anything. Uh, here is, of course, an image of his parents uh, right there, uh, which uh, on the left is his father, Carlo, Carlo Bonaparte, and then his wife, his, his mother, his mother on the right uh, was named Letizia, uh, who I think he really looked up to his mother more uh, than his father. So I think you know, he never really liked his father a whole lot and thought he was a scoundrel, uh, et cetera. Uh, but his father was a lawyer and evidently had enough you know, influence uh, later uh, in France to uh, send him to schools there because uh, Corsica at the time had become part of the French, French you know, empire, uh, et cetera. Uh, they lived at one point in a JCO uh, city, basically main city in Corsica. That's the family home you see uh, on the left uh, right there, uh, which he kind of grew up, you know, there, uh, I guess, as a teenager before, I guess, really, not as a teenager, really as a young, young child as he, before he went to uh, France, which I think actually left Corsica at nine, nine years old, actually, at a much younger age. Uh, going back to uh, discussing, um, you know, uh, his background, of course, as you know, Napoleon became uh, very, very famous, as, like I said, as a military genius. Uh, that's the thing he's kind of known for uh, more than anything. Uh, later, Napoleon was kind of given a nickname by a lot of people. Uh, they often called him the Little Corporal, uh, if you know about this, which was more of a nickname uh, of a terms of endearment is what it really is. A uh, lady was called the Little Emperor, or Petit Emperor, I think if you want the uh, French. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's uh, stories about Napoleon being short, which you may have heard about. Uh, but Napoleon was really more like average height, about five foot six or seven uh, was typically, I think they think, his height. Uh, Napoleon was a pretty good general. We'll get to that later. Uh, I think he fought in at least 70 battles uh, as a general. Uh, throughout his career, I think he won almost 90% of his battles. The ones he lost, you know, later or at the end of his career, uh, more than more than anything. Uh, he attended several uh, schools, by the way, in France. Uh, there was two. He went, like at nine years old, uh, he went to France. And first school he went to is called Brienne Le Chateau, uh, which he attended for like, I want to say five or six years or so. Uh, and then, uh, I think at the age of 15, uh, he then went to the Military Academy of Paris, which I think I've got an image uh, showing you that uh, of, of that particular school, which is right here. Uh, that was the uh, main school of where a lot of the best officers were trained. Uh, it's kind of like uh, France's West Point, uh, which was initially founded by the Bourbon regime. Uh, it's still, of course, a military academy today. Uh, and so uh, at the age of 15, he attended. And uh, because the fact that his father died uh, in 1785, uh, he was supposed to do the program. And like in two years, he did it. He, he graduated one, one year uh, at, at the age of like, I think, 16 uh, when, he, when he graduated. So uh, the, career, the career of Napoleon, you know, started... I think if you know about him as a French military officer, second lieutenant, uh, and it's considered, by the way, one of the greatest military careers probably in history, like like a 30-year period he was, you know, in the military. Uh, now, what really made Napoleon was the French Revolutionary Wars uh, that broke out. Uh, if you know about it, uh, that started way back in 1792 when uh, France declared itself a republic. Uh, they executed, you know, Louis the Sixteenth right right after that uh, via guillotine. And so he had all these countries in Europe, like Austria, Prussia, Britain, Russia, Spain, etc., uh, that felt threatened by this new republic. You know, that was now, you know, in, in Western Europe, uh, they were kind of fearful that, you know, their monarchies would be overthrown. And so that that's part of why. You know, the French Revolutionary Wars broke out, which lasted close to around 10 years uh, that they did. Uh, and so that's that's really that's really what, you know, allowed Napoleon to emerge. They had the so-called War of the First Coalition, which was the, I think, main conflict that was part of the 
whole uh, French Revolutionary Wars, but Napoleon kind of made himself real famous, you know, during that time period. And a lot of it occurred under the Directory government that we, of course, talked about previously from my last lecture. Uh, they talk about various things in his career that were kind of important early on uh, with Napoleon. Uh, one of the first was the so-called Siege of Toulon uh, that happened at the end of 1793. Uh, that siege was where the British had come in with their, their naval fleet, and they uh, laid siege to that French port, which was on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, Napoleon came up with this idea uh, to use artillery uh, to basically push the, the, French na uh, the, the British Navy out uh, at that point. So here's kind of an image showing it right here, but he brought in like um, basically uh, artillery and took a hill to do that and then basically bombarded them and forced them out. Uh, and so I think Napoleon at the time was only a captain. And so after that, he was made a brigadier general. Uh, and so from there, that started his career, you know, pretty much uh, as a general in 1793. Uh, the other thing he's famous for Napoleon too uh, was in uh, 1795. Uh, the uh, you know after the after the you know the Jacobins had been overthrown at that point, uh, you have a deal where uh, the Directory created this constitutional convention, you know, to create a new constitution. Uh, and uh, apparently there was a pro royalist that wanted to storm it and put like the king back in, like a monarch back in. Uh, and so Napoleon was like the only general in town, apparently, that they could bring up uh, to kind of stop the mobs. And so he, he used cannon uh, on, on the mobs, basically. And I think the remark later was he used a whip of grape shot. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, that didn't exactly make him a popular man uh, at first, but later on they find out that Napoleon is a, Pretty good general. Uh, the other thing you may have heard about, too, is that Joseph, uh, Josephine, of course, one of his first wives, uh, well-known, of course, in history. Uh, he met her, uh, I think, thinking around maybe 1795 uh, originally. And uh, if you know about her, uh, she was originally uh, the former mistress of Paul Barat, who had been one of the directors uh, in the directory government. Uh, she was actually from Martinique, uh, which is an island in the Caribbean. She was a French Creole, and her husband had died on the guillotine. Uh, he had been killed by the Jacobins. Uh, actually, she had two two daughters, uh, actually a daughter and a son uh, through her first husband. And so Napoleon married her and I think adopted her two children later. Uh, and she was actually older than Napoleon. And... Um, she actually didn't really like Napoleon. I think she just more or less wanted to marry him because he was kind of rising in power, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there's stories about her later, if you know about it, cheating on Napoleon like several times with, with other, other men. Uh, and Napoleon had like numerous girlfriends. Like I forget how many he had, like 30, 40 girlfriends or something like that uh, at one point. Uh, later she would be, i uh, kind of blow her up here, but later she would be, uh, his first uh, empress consort, uh, which he would uh, in 1804, uh, 1810. Uh, and later he divorced her because he couldn't have any children with her. I guess she was kind of older than him and all that, like I said. And so he later married this woman named uh, Marie Louise, uh, also known as the Duchess of Parma, uh, who happened to be late. Uh, you know about this, the daughter of Emperor Francis of Austria, uh, who later ends up being Napoleon's you know, father-in-law. We had talked about him for uh, remember the last Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and so uh, she would actually give Napoleon his only legitimate son uh, that he would have, uh, which is uh, later Emperor Napoleon II, they called him, or he called him the Eaglet, I think was uh, his nickname. So that's that's who basically uh, she was, uh, Marie, Marie Louise. Now, uh, Napoleon is known for his early military campaign. At this point, he's like an unknown figure. Like, nobody knows who Napoleon is uh, before 1796. Uh, and uh, what happened was he was given his first command uh, in 1796 in control of this army called the Army of Italy, which uh, was a ragtag army uh, that 
uh, was fighting in northern Italy against mostly Austria and another state called Sar Kingdom of Sardinia uh, at the time. Uh, and apparently Paul Barat, who you see that image right there, was the one who gave him the commission, although they think that his wife, Josephine, was the one that got it for him. Uh, I think it was a joke that uh, Napoleon was the general that owed his commission to his wife. <laughs> anyway, but uh, when he got there, you know, the the Austrians and other powers like the Sardinian forces uh, didn't realize what kind of general that Napoleon was. Uh, he was a new, you know, modernized general. And uh, if you see kind of images right here, he basically beat the crap out of them, <laughs> like both of them, like both the Piedmontese, the Sardinian forces and the Austrians. They got beat badly uh, in that campaign. And he pushed, he pushed actually the Austrians out of Italy. He pushed them actually, uh, you know, back in Austria at that point. And I think at that point he was actually driving his forces on Vienna. Uh, and so um, I think his most famous battle they talk about is the Battle of Lodi, uh, which happened on May 10th, 1796. Uh, and uh, supposedly it's that battle, they say, where Napoleon, his forces started calling him the Little Corporal. And so the name got kind of stuck uh, afterwards. And uh, from then on, Napoleon was unbeatable probably until 1812 or uh, 1813. So nobody could beat him you know, for about something like, I don't know, 15 years or whatever it is. Uh, he did actually, one of the weird things about Napoleon, uh, he actually uh, forced Austria to sign a treaty with them called the Treaty of Campo Formio. Uh, what it did basically uh, was Brit Britain was the only power left after that. Uh, so all the powers uh, that were fighting, and I think in that first coalition uh, in the French Revolutionary Wars were all knocked out of the war, uh, except the British. And then France started to take control of Northern Italy at that point, uh, which uh, Napoleon later will create out of a kingdom of Italy, uh, which he'll be the king of. Now, the only thing, though, was, like I said, Britain was still left, like the fight, you know, uh, France and the French Revolutionary Wars. Uh, and so the French came up with this other idea, uh, if you know about it, uh, which was to invade Egypt, which was more of an economic thing, uh, they were hoping. Uh, and uh, what the French wanted to do was they were hoping to trade, uh, they were hoping to destroy uh, Britain's trade routes uh, that went like to India, uh, and I think I think uh, the French and Napoleon kind of had this idea that maybe France could take over India, uh, which they had lost before. As you know, the French had been in India uh, going back to, I think, the Seven Years' War, uh, which they lost control of part of that area uh, to the to the British, uh, et cetera. And so uh, Napoleon, uh, with his uh, French naval forces, landed uh, in in Egypt and started this campaign to try to take over Egypt. Uh, at the time, uh, there's a famous image there of Napoleon, by the way, uh, looking at the Sphinx. I kind of blow that up right there. But I think Napoleon told us, told us uh, troops something like there's 40 centuries looking down upon you, like all the history of, you know, of Egypt uh, and all that. And so uh, they think that he, I'll get to it later, but they think that Napoleon had this secret mission that he had to go to Egypt uh, and study uh, you know, ancient Egypt and its history. And so that, that was something that, that he really was interested in, uh, not just in, you know, controlling that area uh, and all that. Uh, and um, I'll get to Horatio Nelson, but he kind of upsets the apple cart, you know, with the French fleet that's there. Uh, but uh, one of the, the most strategic battle that really is fought uh, at that point uh, if you know about Egypt, it was controlled by the, what they call the Mamluks, who were mercenaries of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, their forces were antiquated against really modernized French forces. Uh, and so Napoleon just routed them uh, in what became known as the so-called Battle of the Pyramids on July 21st, 1798. And then from there, he was able to take Cairo uh, right afterwards. Uh, the only thing was uh, later, like in August of 1798, his fleet, though, is destroyed. Like the, ma the majority of the French fleet is actually uh, discovered by uh, Lord Horatio Nelson's forces. 
Uh, they were kind of looking for his forces, like where the French fleet went to. And apparently uh, the French fleet was in like the Nile Delta uh, in what is called Abu Kerb Bay. Uh, and uh, anyway, the British fleet sailed into it and attacked his fleet and destroyed most of it. Uh, and so about 13 ships were either captured or destroyed uh, by Nelson. Uh, and so um, the Battle of the Nile, as they call it, was kind of considered one of the strategic naval battles uh, of the war, along with the uh, naval battle of Trafalgar later. Now, I did want to talk about one thing that is very famous, of course, about Napoleon, of course, in Egypt. Uh, there's a lot of Egyptology, you know, that's associated with Napoleon because uh, they think he's kind of considered one of the early fathers of it, of starting it uh, at that point. Uh, and um, if you know what happened was in 17, uh, they think 99, I think was the year, uh, apparently there was this stone that was discovered in a, a town called Rosetta, which is in the Nile Delta. And uh, there was a um, French soldier who I think was an engineer named Pierre-Francois Bouchard that found it. It was like way back half a ton. And it had this inscription on it that went back to the Ptolemaic dynasty. And it proved to be pretty important, like in Egyptian history. Uh, and uh, later it took a while, but this man you see there, kind of kind of show that right there, man named um, Jean-Francois uh, Jean uh, <clears throat> uh, Champollion was the one that actually uh, got a copy of, of the Rosetta Stone and was began translating it in the 1820s. Uh, and so... Uh, that stone, you know, proved to be pretty vital in, you know, cracking hieroglyphs, Egyptian hieroglyphs, which were, I think, a, kind of a dead language since, you know, going back to the early Middle Ages. Uh, and so that that's going to be very important in learning more about Egypt, uh, not just the different dynasties, but the different pharaohs of Egypt uh, and its history. And uh, the stone itself now resides in the British Museum in London, uh, which is kind of controversial today, I know, to modern Egypt, uh, but it's something that Napoleon, you know, helped jumpstart uh, modern Egyptology because after that, you, you start, of course, having a lot of people that come in uh, that kind of fortune hunters that come in and start stealing stuff too. And uh, that's why countries like France, Britain, and other countries uh, have a lot of um, artifacts, you know, uh, in, in, in their countries because of that afterwards, because of early Egyptology, et cetera. Now, I'm going to move on to talk more about some other things. So he has the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, of course, right there. But let me get into, of course, the next thing that happens with Napoleon, of course, with his career. Uh, what ends up happening, because of the fact that Napoleon is becoming a household name, uh, like in Europe, and, of course, because, you know, Egypt, uh, et cetera, eventually what's going to occur, he's going to seize control of the country, uh, which he will uh, in 1799. And they call it the so-called coup of 18 Brumaire. Uh, this was, of course, a coup d'etat where Napoleon basically overthrew uh, the French directory government. Uh, the actual date was November 9th, uh, I guess, in the Gregorian calendar uh, today. Uh, but it begins the so-called age of Napoleon, of course, that'll, of course, follow uh, later. There it is right there. Well, Napoleon basically used the military to overthrow uh, the French directory government. Uh, and uh, apparently uh, the actual coup, kind of show it right here, but it took place uh, at this uh, chateau called Chateau de Saint-Cloud, Saint which is kind of a little west of Paris at the time by the Seine River. Uh, and <clears throat> at this point, they think that with Napoleon seizing power uh, in um, 1799, a lot of people kind of view it as being the end, end of the French Revolution uh, and uh, Napoleon kind of remarked later that I am the French Revolution. Uh, so um, he's going to come in, take over uh, the country. And a lot of people in Europe kind of view it more like a dictatorship because uh, he, you know, controls a lot of the military right there. Uh, that chateau, by the way, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was destroyed during the Franco-Prussian War. Now, let me get into like the governments of Napoleon. The first government that he put in, uh, if you know about this, was the so-called French consulate, uh, which was part of a constitution uh, that they adopted at that point, France, uh, in 1799. 
Uh, this was a Republican government where uh, it was run by uh, these three consuls of state, uh, which were called first consul, second consul, and third consul, uh, with Napoleon, by the way, controlling most of the power uh, within it, because you know, he's you know, head of the military uh, and all that. Uh, foreigners kind of saw it, like I said, as almost like a dictatorship uh, more than anything. And uh, he kind of viewed it, by the way, like, like you see there, kind of influenced from Julius Caesar. He was, you know, Roman consul like a long time ago. And so that was the idea of this. And uh, by the way, this was all done through an election. He was actually elected uh, in a referendum. Uh, I think one time, I want to say, I think their first referendum, I want to say, uh, was in... Um, I think that was in 1799. And there was a second referendum in 1802 uh, to make him uh, consul for life. Uh, and then in 1804, later on, uh, he'll be also uh, elected emperor uh, also. So it, and I'm going to get to it, too, and talk about as well, like Napoleon, as you know, he's also this reformer uh, as well. He's known for his reforms uh, to uh, the state. And I've got kind of a list of them right here of different things that Napoleon's uh, kind of known for. Uh, Napoleonic cut. That's, you know, the one thing that's probably the most famous thing uh, that Napoleon did, you know, as the ruler of France at the time. He created these new set of laws uh, that were issued in eight, 1804, which uh, I think the original name they called it uh, is the Civil Code, Civil Code of 1804. Uh, it's got all kinds of names that they called it, but they do think this code uh, was heavily influenced by not just the Enlightenment, uh, but a lot of Roman laws, like going back to the Justinian Code uh, that was created in the 6th century uh, under Emperor Justinian, the great uh, Byzantine emperor. Uh, and so it was one of these first law code systems that were kind of modernized, but also they got rid of a lot of the feudal codes that were kind of still on the books, you know, before uh, the French Revolution, et cetera. And uh, you can see every person was equal before the law. No secret laws could, could exist. All laws had to be published. Uh, religious crimes were illegal. Uh, divorce was treated as a civil manner, of course, in the country. And it granted men, like, basically all equal rights, uh, under the law. I think it did include women at first, uh, but women will later get rights, of course, later uh, in France uh, in modern times. So Napoleonic Code was a major influence. Uh, if you know about the Napoleonic Code, uh, it's influenced later Europe, but also Louisiana. Louisiana's law codes are heavily influenced uh, by the Napoleonic Code. It's part of why the bar exam is much tougher to take in Louisiana than any other state uh, in the United States. Uh, other things he did, too, uh, did want to mention about uh, is education reforms. One thing that Napoleon did do, uh, he started uh, to create uh, reforms where they educated Frenchmen, like men at first, uh, more than anything. And it started in, uh, they think, in 1801. <clears throat> they started like, creating what they call lycees, uh, which are, I guess, now high schools uh, to the French today. Uh, and so upper level secondary type schools uh, were created, which initially was for like, I think, ages 10 to 16, uh, which uh, over like a seven year period uh, that way you, you would be educated. Uh, and so that's why later, you know, like in the United States, why you have a middle school, high school, which is like seven years, three years in middle school, four years in high school. That's kind of where the origin of that came from, of course, later. Now, I think Lycees now you can go on from like either college or technical school you know, from there, kind of like in the German model, I think, also uh, as well. Uh, of course, the Bank de France, that's one thing you may have heard about. In fact, Napoleon, I think it was about 1800, you may have heard about this, uh, created the first national bank, one of the first national banks in France. Though I think under John Law, going back to Louis XV, they had an early national bank that flopped, that, that, that went bankrupt. Uh, so he created this one, which still exists, by the way, today. And still a bank in France today. I think it's a corporation now, uh, but it's something Napoleon that started, which I think Swiss bankers <clears throat> were the one, ones that kind of started it, and they're the ones that kind of bankrolled Napoleon anyway. Uh, oh, the other thing he did, too, was he created this thing called the, uh, he passed this thing called the Concordat of 1801, it was dubbed, <clears throat> and what it did was it brought back 
the Catholic faith to uh, France, which, remember, the Jacobins had taken away <clears throat> at that point. Uh, and uh, the Pope at the time was uh, Pope Pius VII was the Pope uh, in Rome. And so uh, later, I'll get to it later, but the Pope's there when, when, when Napoleon gets crowned, you know, emperor and all that. Uh, and so uh, this basically made, you know, the Catholic faith, the main religion of France, you know, you know at that point afterwards. But uh, other religions could be practiced legally. So if you were Jewish, Protestant, whatever, even Muslim, maybe uh, you could practice, you know, whatever religion. And Napoleon, by the way, was not religious. I don't know if you know much about that. Uh, he wasn't really a religious man, et cetera. I think he was even one, one of the first uh, major uh, rulers to emancipate groups like the like the Jews, like in Europe. He ban began trying to emancipate them, you know, throughout Europe and things like that. Uh, oh yeah, the metric system. Like Napoleon didn't invent the mes metric system. If you know much about that, but uh, that is something that Napoleon uh, helped to spread uh, because of his conquests, like all throughout Europe. Uh, and it, it eventually, you know, replaced the British imperial system uh, that we kind of borrow, you know, in the United States, uh, et cetera. And you can see all that right here, the difference between the, you know, the what we've got versus the metric system. We got the foot, inch, mile, yard. And then with the length, you got centimeter, kilometer, uh, meter, and millimeter. And so you can see kind of all the differences right there. Uh, weight, mass differences too. And then the liquid volume capacity also uh, as well. So those are all things that Napoleon, you know, like when he conquered Europe, they kind of, France was already kind of using it and it spread it after that. Uh, the Legion of Honor, you may have heard about that. That was something that Napoleon uh, established in 1802, uh, which was a French merit system uh, to honor citizens, soldiers uh, that had done good things for the country, uh, et cetera. And it had like five ranks that were to it, by the way, uh, which were uh, the lowest rank was a knight, followed by an officer, commander, grand officer. And then the top the top one was the grand master. Uh, and uh, they would give you like medals. Uh, you had medals and ranks. Uh, and if you know about the French, the French military was the first to have like ranks, like on their shoulders and things like that, like they have now, you know, with like soldiers today. Uh, and um, the uh, Napoleon was the one that had the, um, he had like a type of, of medal they created called the Grand Cross, uh, which later uh, is worn by the president of France, like President Macron, of course, wears the Grand Cross now. Uh, and so I think I've got an image showing Napoleon like wearing uh, the Grand Cross uh, right there. On the left side of his, uh, well, the one on the left, picture on the left right there, you can see him wear it right there, but. Today, today, that's the only person that wears it is the, the president of France, of course, today. Right, now, the big thing that happens with Napoleon, of course, which was kind of controversial about 1804, uh, was him being crowned emperor, uh, which he would, uh, in, you know, Notre Dame Cathedral. That's part of why that cathedral is kind of famous in Paris, which I think burned a few years ago, if you know about that. Uh, and um, through an election, uh, the people of France uh, elected him emperor in a referendum, which supposedly 3.5 million people voted uh, yes uh, for him to become emperor. 2,500 voted no. You want to? I don't know what happened to those guys. <laughs> they voted no. Uh, but anyway, um, so he was crowned crowned emperor at that point, December December second, 1804. Uh, it was controversial. Uh, the reason why there's a story where uh, when the Pope brought the crown to him. He took it and he put it on his head. And so the Pope crowning him, uh, but that was actually planned for him to do that. And then he, of course, he crowned his wife uh, as his empress consort. And a lot of people in Europe didn't like this that when it happened uh, because uh, they felt like he wasn't a legitimate ruler, didn't have the bloodline uh, and all that. And so that, that really rankled a lot of people, of course, throughout Europe. And it would course, caused a lot of wars, Polyannic wars, of course, that would follow, of course, later. Kind of, so you're kind of showing here. You can see the Pope there in the background to the right of Napoleon uh, as he begins to put the crown uh, on his head. I think Napoleon once said that he found the crown of France in the gutter and he put it on his head. There's his wife right there, uh, Josephine, kind of kneeling uh, in front of, front of him. And of course, she would be, like I said, crowned 
uh, as his empress consort, of course, afterwards. Now, of course, what would happen, as you know, was that Napoleon, you know, seizing power and all that in France uh, would bring on one of the bloodiest conflicts, by the way, uh, in, in Europe, which is the so-called Napoleonic Wars, uh, which, by the way, were a series of wars which lasted from 1803 to about 1815. So about around 12 years uh, was about how long the wars lasted overall. It was, by the way, one of the bloodiest wars uh, in the 19th century. I think something like 3 million or more people died in the war. It might be more than that. Uh, they think that's just a conservative estimate how many they think died. It's one of the bloodiest wars, by the way, before you get really World War I. Uh, that'll happen where it's like even way more uh, than that. But you've got a series of conflicts that break out because you have all these different European powers that realize that Napoleon is becoming, he's creating this real powerful state this empire, you know, uh, and it's creating a misbalance of power throughout Europe. And so they want to try to stop all that. And so all these powers in Europe at one point, Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, what's left of it, uh, Sweden even gets involved. And they try to stop Napoleon, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, et cetera. So that's what brings on the whole so-called Napoleonic Wars. Uh, here's kind of an image showing you, by the way, the extent of the Napoleonic Empire, which it had different names. It was called, I think the common name that they often called it was the First French Empire. Uh, that's, what they, that's what they usually call it. Uh, and then uh, some, some people also called it the Grand Empire of Napoleon. That was the name that he preferred to call it, was the Grand or Great Empire. So yeah, you can see all the territory. At one point, he had control of like, parts of Europe from like Portugal and Spain controlling those states all the way uh, through Central Europe, Italy, uh, and into uh, like Poland, uh, that far east. Uh, and so you don't really see anybody else that does that until Adolf Hitler comes along, you know, with the rise of Nazi Germany uh, before World War II and during World War II. Now, there's one thing that does, that's famous about Napoleon. Napoleon had this other idea, not just to take over Europe, but to take, take over America. He wanted to take over, like, Louisiana and control all that. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, but there was something that happened that kind of prevented him from really controlling Louisiana. Uh, they had the Haitian Revolution that broke out uh, in Haiti, uh, led by that Toussaint Louverture, you may have heard of, who was a famous Haitian revolutionary. Uh, and anyway, um, he sold. He, he basically decided to sell Louisiana because he wasn't going to be able to, because Haiti was going to be used as base uh, to you know to take over like America at that point. Uh, and so he um, he eventually sells he sells Louisiana for like fifteen million dollars to the United States uh, under Thomas Jefferson uh, at the time, and. Um, that's going to be very important. If you know about Louisiana Purchase, he uses the Louisiana Purchase to build his so-called La Grande Armée, the Great Army of Napoleon, will be eventually uh, formed from that money uh, that he used used from from the selling Louisiana, uh, which France only controlled for like three years. About uh, and uh, so he's going to create one of the greatest modernized armies in history uh, overall, <clears throat> and. Um, I think what it was, he wanted to stick it to the British because he, I guess he could have sold it to the British, that kind of thing. He didn't want to do that because Britain was their enemy. And so he decided to sell it to the United States, which he thought was an upstart country that might eventually be able to beat the British. I don't know. I'm thinking he must have been thinking that more than anything. But yeah, it was, Louisiana Purchase, uh, that was considered one of the greatest land deals uh, in history. Uh, 530 million acres <clears throat> was the amount of territory that United States got uh, out of that, which was like something like two or three cents an acre. <laughs> Crazy, huh, in history. Uh, but anyway, let me move on and talk about Napoleon and some of the, course, uh, battles that he was kind of involved in. Uh, between 1803 to 1807, Napoleon defeated Europe in a series of battles, which was called the Wars of the Third and Fourth Coalitions. It was sometimes called uh, and uh, there was even a failed invasion of Britain, which didn't work out. 
uh, for Napoleon. <clears throat> and so um, they had different things that happened. Uh, one of the things that that's famous, I'll get to first before I get to anything, uh, was uh, Napoleon, uh, if you know about it, <clears throat> was one of the try to invade. He's going to probably, he's going to take on basically uh, uh, Austria uh, in, in the war. Uh, that's really considered to be one of the most famous battles really in the war. Uh, so it was part of this campaign called the Ulm Campaign uh, in 18, late 1805. <clears throat> and um, at first, France was going to invade England, but he realized that he couldn't cross the English Channel because, uh, you know, the British Navy was just too powerful at that point. And so he decided to take his Grand Army and march it into basically Austria, crossing the Rhine River. And so it led to a three-week campaign that was called the Ulm Campaign. Uh, that was dubbed, and Napoleon was able to defeat the Austrian forces really quickly, like in a three-week period, and he seized control of Vienna at that point. Well, it brought on a battle called the Battle of Austerlitz, which you see uh, right here. Austerlitz uh, was considered one of the early pivotal battles of the Napoleonic Wars, and what happened was the Russians and the Austrian force, they combined their forces to try and see if they could defeat Napoleon, uh, who had about 70,000 troops. And so what is now the, the, the modern state of the Czech Republic, uh, near the town of Austerlitz, the, two, the three forces basically fought each other uh, in that battle. And it was later dubbed, if you know about this, they had a nickname of the battle. It was called later the Battle of Three Emperors because of the fact that you had three emperors present. Uh, the Emperor of Russia, Alexander I. Uh, you had Napoleon of France, who was emperor, and Emperor Francis of Austria. So those are all the three different rulers uh, that you had uh, that were there. Uh, Austerlitz, by the way, was considered to be Napoleon's greatest military victory. Uh, it's the one I think that a lot of people have studied uh, over time. Uh, and uh, anyway, Napoleon's forces, just even though it was like a smaller force, uh, they totally routed uh, the Russian-Austrian forces, uh, who suffered something like 36,000 killed, wounded, and captured. The French only suffered 8,000. That's it, uh, to kind of give you an idea. Uh, today, there's a, a monument that's there now called the Cairn of Peace Memorial uh, that was put there, and it's a memorial to the people that died there uh, during the Battle of Austerlitz. Uh, later, Napoleon, if you know about this, would commission the Arc de Triomphe, if we're this in Paris, France, it was built to commemorate uh, some of the victories uh, in the war. It was also used as a war memorial to those that died, of course, uh, in, I guess, the Napoleonic Wars and maybe later wars also uh, in France. But it took a lot of years for them to finish it I think I want to say it was finished in 1830, I think, when it was finally completed. Uh, yeah, they had the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, sometimes talk about that. But, yeah, Napoleon, uh, in, uh, you know about this, had this idea to invade Britain uh, using, like, the French Navy. And so he combined his force with the, with the Spanish uh, fleets uh, as well, which I think for a while Spain kind of supported uh France in, 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 in the Napoleonic Wars for a while. Uh, and uh, what happened, though, uh, was off the coast of Spain, near the, what, they call, what they call Cape Trafalgar. Uh, what happened on October the 21st, Lord Nelson, who we've talked about before, Admiral Nelson, too, uh, his fleet would basically defeat a larger force. Uh, they had 27 ships, uh, and the French-Spanish fleet had 33 ships, and uh, they routed them uh, in the battle. Uh, and if you know about it, Nelson was killed uh, in the battle, uh, I think by a sharpshooter, uh, but it proved to be considered one of the greatest naval battles, really, of the whole Napoleonic Wars. And it's part of why, you know, Napoleon doesn't take Britain because uh, of the British Navy uh, and all that. So anyway, I'm going to also, there's <clears throat> Lord Nelson right there has been immortalized uh, Trafalgar Square, of course, you know, of course, and also London uh, also as well. <clears throat> Uh, that's the HMS Victory. That's the famous flagship, of course, of Lord Nelson, uh, which is now a museum ship, of course, also in England uh, as well. Now, yeah, Napoleon would keep going. You can see here uh, he would win a bunch of other battles later. 
uh, as well. Uh, there's a few other things, of course, that happened. We study about uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, at that point. Uh, from there, uh, what happens is Austria is defeated at that point. <clears throat> and what happens is there's a treaty that's signed between the French Empire in Austria, which is called the Treaty of Pressburg. What it does is it breaks up the Holy Roman Empire, which you know, I told you Emperor Francis is the last Holy Roman Emperor, uh, and so he becomes Francis I of Austria afterwards. And then Napoleon starts creating all these buffer states throughout Europe, like the Confederation of the Rhine, uh, around the Rhine River, uh, which was a buffer state he put between Austria and France. <clears throat> Uh, then what happened was Prussia wanted to keep fighting uh, in the war. And so that led to the so-called War of the Fourth Coalition, where Napoleon then invaded Prussia in 1806. And Prussia really was no match to the French forces. Uh, and um, at the time, <clears throat> if you know about this, uh, Prussia was ruled by Frederick William III. And uh, anyway... His forces got routed in two battles, the Battle of Jena and then the Battle of Arstadt. Uh, so from there, Prussia gets knocked out of the war uh, also uh, as well. And Prussia won't come back from the war until 1813, to kind of give you an idea. Uh, then in 1807, there was one more battle called the Battle of Friedland, uh, which happened in June of 1807. Uh, from there, Napoleon then invaded Poland, uh, to uh, go after, <clears throat> basically, uh, Russia uh, under Emperor Alexander's forces. And they were routed, too, uh, in another battle, which they think was fought where now Kaliningrad is today, uh, which used to be part, I think, where Poland, East Prussia used to be. And so that, that pretty much ended a lot of the early battles of the whole Napoleonic Wars, uh, where Napoleon is more supreme, you know, from there. Now, what happened after that, there was an agreement made uh, with Russia and also Prussia, which was called the Peace of Tilsit, which was signed between the powers uh, in July of 1807, which was actually, I think, two treaties, one signed with Russia and one signed with Prussia. Uh, what it basically did was it forced those states to basically become allies with France, with the French Empire uh, and then it left the British alone to basically fight, you know, Napoleon. There was nobody else pretty much again uh, to fight. Uh, that happened uh, with that. <clears throat> and then also uh, another thing that happened too, which I'll admit as well, uh, from there, Napoleon also created a bunch of buffer states, which some of these were kind of controversial at the time. Kingdom of Westphalia, which was in the western part uh, of Germany at the time. Uh, the Duchy of Warsaw was an idea to create a Polish state, which Napoleon thought needed uh, in Europe. Free city of Danzig was also created uh, as well. Uh, the Russians didn't like the Duchy of Warsaw idea, though, because uh, they thought that Poland ought to be part of Russia, uh, etc. So that's kind of Napoleon by 1807, just taking over Europe, uh, control of it, and all these other states that are there kind of having to basically ally with him uh, or be, I guess, occupied uh, by his forces. So Britain, Britain's alone. That's the only state really uh, to try to defeat Napoleon uh, at this point. So there's a piece of Tilsit, of course, right there. Um, now, um, I'm going to talk about what happens after that. Now, Napoleon, now he's pretty much, like I said, up to like 1807, looking like he's going to take over Europe uh, at this point. But uh, if you study about Napoleon, his empire doesn't last very long. It, like, you know, he pretty much collapsed within like about five to six years, uh, right after he starts consolidating all this control of, of, the, of the continent. Uh, and uh, I'll kind of go through and talk about some of the major causes of why Napoleon's empire collapsed. Uh, one of the most famous you may have heard of uh, is the continental system. Uh, which was this economic plan to weaken the British uh, by putting embargoes on them or blockading them economically, strengthen Europe, uh, et cetera. And uh, they think the failure of it, you know, 
uh, was part of the reason why his empire would eventually break up. Uh, one thing about the British, the British had a better navy uh, than the French did. Uh, and so that really prevented Napoleon from really being more successful uh, with the continental system. And then also, if you know about the, the turn of the century going into the 19th century, a lot of countries started to practice free trade. That was something starting to be popular, where countries wanted to trade with different nations and things like that. So you had countries that wanted to trade with Britain. You know, they had this vast empire they were forming throughout the world. And so you had countries that wanted to do that uh, and all that. Uh, they do think that uh, one thing about the continental system, uh, they do think that it actually caused the War of 1812 uh, to break out uh, between the United States uh, in Britain, uh, which a lot of it had to do with the fact that the British uh, were seizing American ships on the high seas because uh, apparently the Americans under, you know, uh, presidents like Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, et cetera, wanted to trade uh, with the French, uh, but the British didn't want them to do that. Uh, and so uh, that that's part of what caused the war. Uh, and then I think the United States wanted to take over Canada et cetera. And so that's that's what brought on the war uh, and all that. And so at one point you can see that image there that the that the British forces actually attacked uh, part of the United States and actually burned the White House. Uh, and also the main Congress building was also burned uh, as well. You can see the image of the White House being burned uh, right there. So we're kind of still sore about, by the way, uh, the United States. Uh, but we later got our revenge. If you know, like New Orleans and Louisiana, uh, we put a bad defeat on the British forces at the Battle of New Orleans, January 8th, uh, 1815. But the war was already over. <laughs> that's all you think about that. I think the Peace of Ghent, I think it was, it was called. But yeah, that shows you how powerful uh, the British uh, Empire is. They're fighting us as they're fighting Napoleon, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, also, another thing that weakened uh, Napoleon was the so-called Peninsular War uh, that broke out. Uh, in Spain and Portugal, uh, it was a major conflict where what happened was uh, Napoleon took over Portugal and then he also took over Spain. Uh, the reason why uh, was especially Portugal was aligned with the uh, British. They wanted to trade with them. And so I think at first what happened was Napoleon, I think in 1807, went into Portugal, occupied it, and then he went into Spain, took it over, and he put his brother, he had a brother named Joseph Napoleon, uh, Bonaparte, he put him on the throne of Spain, and that caused a huge war to break out uh, on the continent. Uh, and so uh, what happened was the Peninsula War, which you see here, which, by the way, was pretty bloody. It was a pretty bloody conflict. Uh, I think the French end up losing like something like 300,000 men uh, trying to take control uh, of those countries. And it was predominantly a guerrilla war. Like, I think they consider this one to be one of the first modern guerrilla wars uh, that's really fought. Uh, and um, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, were backed up by the British. Uh, the, the British sent this general you may have heard of named uh, the Duke of Wellington, uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley, known later as the Ar Iron Duke. Uh, and that's part of where he got his early name uh, as a soldier. But I'll probably, we'll kind of, we'll kind of see later what happens uh, because of all this nationalist stuff that's going on uh, in Portugal and Spain, and you know the the, the really the, the royal dynasty there kind of lose power uh, for a while. It actually sparks the Latin American revolutions that break out all over in the New World. That's why they lose control of those colonies who basically declare their independence uh, afterwards. Uh, then, of course, of course, of course well, one more thing, by the way, about the whole Peninsula War. Uh, it was also known for a lot of uh, atrocities being committed. Uh, there's been paintings made, uh, like the one by Francisco Goya, uh, that's kind of well known, uh, where they basically took civilians and shot them uh, and stuff like that, the French. And so the French kind of got a bad name, you know, for committing atrocities, you know, during, during the war. Now, the big thing that they talk about that really ended Napoleon's army was his invasion of Russia, which happened in 1812, which uh, the Russians later called this campaign uh, the Patriotic War. 
Uh, and yeah, it was one of the bloodiest campaigns, really, of the whole war, of the whole conflict of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and um, why why did th this, of course, occur in 1812? Uh, well, um, what happened was in 1812, uh, Russia, you know, ruled by Emperor Alexander the First, uh, violated the continental system. He began to trade with the British. Uh, I think the Russians needed grain. Uh, and so um, Napoleon decided to take his Grand Army, uh, of course, into Russia and force them to, you know, back the Peace of Tilsit, which they had signed back in 1807. And so, like I said, it was considered one of the largest invasions in history. I think he had something like five, 600,000 troops maybe at one point uh, that he invaded with uh, Napoleon. But most of the force that he actually invaded with, most of them were mercenaries uh, that he acquired. Uh, throughout Europe uh, from different countries. I want to say about 200,000, maybe a third of the forces were actually French forces uh, that were under him. Uh, the Russians, by the way, responded using like guerrilla warfare, uh, scorched earth policies, uh, which they kind of used, you know, before and later. Uh, they, they used that, you know, I think against Hitler, I know, uh, during World War II. And Peter the Great used it against Sweden, you know, in the Great Northern War. And uh, what Napoleon finds out about Russia, Russia was this vast country which was very poor. And so uh, he realized it was a logistical nightmare trying to, to feed his forces, uh, supply them, uh, and all that. And I think Napoleon once said that an army marches on its stomach. You know, it, it, logistics was what killed his army, you know, more than, more than anything. But yeah, he invades with this huge army, you know, at that point. Uh, and um, they do have battles that were fought in Russia, which you see there. That's really considered the most famous battle uh, that was really fought, uh, which uh, I think General Kutuzov, that was one of his most famous generals that he actually fought against. And yeah, that battle took place on September 7th, uh, 1812. Uh, really the bloodiest battle, really, of the whole Russian campaign. Uh, and it was considered a French tactical victory because they were fighting over like a crossroads area west of Moscow, uh, which would allow him to then take the city of Moscow, but at a high cost, like losing a lot of men uh, in the process. Uh, and within like a week or so, he would then take Moscow uh, following that. Uh, but uh, the only thing about after Borodino, when he took Moscow, uh, apparently, the emperor, Alexander I, refused to sue for peace. Uh, in fact, they retreated, to I think, to the east of Moscow and burned it. They burned the city of Moscow, if you know about that, the Russians. Uh, and so uh, from there, Napoleon's going to be forced to eventually retreat back to, to basically to Ports Poland is what he's going to do. That's when Napoleon loses most of his force. Like on the way back, uh, you know, Napoleon suffers horribly because of the Russian winter. It finishes off the rest of his forces uh, at that point. And uh, I think there's an image showing you, like, Napoleon in his retreat. There's a lot of images showing you, basically, like, on a horse uh, with his men kind of shivering. But a lot of that's propaganda. A lot of cases, he was real warm, and his men were suffering and frostbite and dying in the cold, uh, et cetera or being harassed on the on their flanks by, by Russian soldiers or Cossacks. Uh, and uh, so you can see the loss, like the loss of forces that Napoleon he has this huge army that he marched toward Moscow. But by the time he gets back, he's only got a few thousand left uh, of his men. Uh, by the way, the invasion of Russia, like I said, was the bloodiest conflict of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, they think close to almost a million people died uh, like casualties wise uh, in just that Eastern front uh, in the war. But it, it pales to comparison to like World War II where the Eastern front between the Soviets and the Nazi Germany was just ridiculous, like maybe 20, 30 million or more. Now with uh, Napoleon being defeated uh, in, in pretty much uh, in Russia, it's gonna lead to eventually uh, the coalition powers forming against them in what they call the War of the Sixth Coalition. It's usually dubbed 
between 1813 and 1815. And so they, a lot of the forces in Europe amass troops against him to try to stop Napoleon because they feel he's weak uh, at that point. And that leads to a battle called the Battle of Leipzig, uh, which takes place in northern Germany near a uh, city or town called Leipzig. Uh, and in that, in that battle, uh, basically four countries, Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Sweden, field armies against Napoleon. And it was, by the way, considered one of the largest battles uh, ever fought in Europe uh, at the time. I think all of Europe, maybe, up to late modern times. Uh, and um, nicknamed sometimes the Battle of the Nations because, you know, so many countries were fighting in this one battle, uh, you know, for supremacy of Europe, I guess. And so uh, it's one of the largest battles in Europe until World War I. Uh, like I'll get to it later, the first battle of Marne, they actually have five, 600,000 killed and wounded in that first battle of World War I to kind of give you a comparison you know, of the different battles. So Leipzig is important. The battle, the battle of Leipzig is the, one, the battle that leads to the collapse of the Napoleonic Empire. So his empire basically starts collapsing. He starts losing territory uh, overall. And uh, what happens from there, the coalition forces then invade France. Uh, and it's going to force Napoleon to uh, eventually abdicate the throne, uh, which he will. Uh, there's Napoleon by pretty much 1814 on the left, kind of just disgusted about what's happened to his empire. And so April of 1814, he, try, uh, he pretty much goes into exile uh, after he abdicates. And they send him to an island, by the way, uh, the coalition powers. They send him to Elba, uh, to, to off the coast of Italy. Uh, which is one of two exiles that Napoleon uh, will be sent. Now, they do have this thing called the Congress of Vienna that follows uh, after Napoleon is first defeated uh, in 1814. Uh, what was the Congress, Congress of Vienna? Uh, it was this diplomatic conference uh, that was held in Vienna, Austria, between the major powers in Europe uh, to decide, like, the fate of post-Napoleon Europe, like what they were going to do with Europe afterwards and who were going to be the rulers uh, and all that. And it was chaired by that man you see there on the right named Clemens von Metternich, uh, who was an Austrian statesman, uh, kind of like a prime minister as well. And uh, he pretty much chaired the whole thing between uh, 1814 to 1815. And uh, the Congress of Vienna had nicknames later. They sometimes call it the Vienna Settlement or uh, the Congress System, or uh, the, Con the Concert of Europe, I think was another name they called it. And it created the so-called Age of Metternich that would follow afterwards, where they would put back in a lot of conservative-type governments. Uh, what, did, what did Metternich want to do? Uh, Metternich wanted to create a balance of power in Europe between the different great powers, uh, not just France, Austria, but Russia, Prussia, Britain, uh, etc., uh, so they wanted to kind of keep a balance of power uh, and have no one country be more powerful over another. And so that helped to prevent really like big wars like the Napoleonic Wars from really breaking out. Uh, he also restored the royal families of, of pretty much of Europe was, was another thing we'll get to uh, that they also do uh, as well. Like the French bourbons are put back in, if you know about that, was something they did. Uh, and then also, uh, they also tried to prevent the spread of like liberal radical ideas that the French Revolution and Napoleon were trying to spread uh, throughout Europe, nationalist ideas. And so they wanted to remain Europe being conservative, uh, traditionally conservative monarchs and things like that is what they wanted pretty much. Uh, of course, we'll get to it later, but one of the, the big things that he's going to do uh, that the you know, Congress does. Uh, that's famous. I'll talk about it later, but they're, they're going to put the Bourbons back on the throne of France. Uh, I'll get more into Louis the 18th, but Louis the 18th, uh, one of the younger brothers, Louis the 16th, is going to come in uh, in 1814 and become the ruler of France. The Bourbons will rule till 1830 in control of the country. But I'll get to it. Napoleon kind of upsets the apple cart almost when he tries to take over France again which we'll talk about later. Uh, oh, also, I'll get to it when I get more of the 19th century, but they also created this thing called the German Confederation, you may have heard of, uh, which was a replacement of the Holy Roman Empire. 
Uh, and what they did was they took all the German uh, states and they kind of created a federation of them where Germany was included, like Austria and Prussia. And uh, a lot of people kind of view it as a precursor to the German nation today. Uh, that'll be later uh, in. Uh, we'll talk more about that later when I get to the you know, 19th century, but it really wasn't really a powerful state or anything like that. It had actual federal diet at Frankfurt, uh, believe it or not, uh, but it didn't really have any real power. So we'll talk about later about the German Confederation. But here's the map of Europe, what it looked like uh, after you know the whole uh, Congress of Vienna met between 1814 and 1815. So the idea was to create this balance of power, you know, throughout Europe and neither side, you know, would have one country that's more powerful than the other. And that was the whole point of what they were trying to do at that point. Now, there's something that happened, though, that kind of upset, you know, the apple cart, uh, if you know about it. Uh, Napoleon, who was like an exile uh, in Elba, decided to come back. Uh, to France. He thought that he, he was still popular uh, at that point. And so um, he, he returns in, I think, around March of 1815, the so-called 100 days period is what they usually refer to it. Uh, and uh, so he restores the French empire. Uh, and so it leads to another war, I think, called the War of the Seventh Coalition, uh, they called it. And so Britain uh, brings up forces at that point. Uh, Prussia brings up forces. And Austria and Russia, I think, were going to bring up forces too, uh, but they never really got involved directly in it, uh, except Britain and Prussia, pretty much. So it's called 100 Days because Napoleon was in power for about 100 days uh, as emperor between March to June uh, of 1850. Uh, we'll get to him in a second, but it's going to lead to the Battle of Waterloo, which happens in June of 1815, considered the pivotal battle of the whole, you know, Napoleonic Wars uh, in, in the end. And uh, the Battle of Waterloo was a battle that was fought in central Belgium uh, on June 18, 1815. Uh, France was predominantly posed by the British forces. Uh, they were led by the Duke of Wellington, who I've talked about before. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, I told you uh, previously, uh, had fought helping out the Spanish and the Portuguese. Uh, and he had nicknames like the English Leopard was the name that I think the Spanish called him, I think, at one point. And later he was called the Iron Duke, uh, was another great nickname he was called. He was later Prime Minister of Britain. I don't know if you know about this, uh, but he is later. I know that uh, in a few years later after, after the Napoleonic Wars. And, uh, yeah, he was considered one of the greatest British commanders of the whole war, but more of a defensive-type commander, by the way, which helped him at Waterloo uh, pretty much. And uh, here's kind of an image of the Waterloo site. Uh, apparently, Napoleon had 75,000 troops. Wellington had 68,000. And Prussia had forces nearby, led by this general named Gebhard von Blücher, uh, who had, you know, been able to, you know, combine their forces. And that would really change the whole outcome, you know, of the battle, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, apparently in the battle, uh, Napoleon tried to attack Wellington, who had the high ground, uh, and um, he charged at Wellington Center with cavalry charges. And then uh, one of the most famous things that happened uh, at the Battle of Waterloo was that Napoleon brought up his Imperial Guard uh, to try to attack Wellington Center, and they basically retreated. They basically just gave up at that point, saving every man for himself, I think. And so Basically, what happened at Waterloo was that Napoleon got routed badly, uh, his forces. Uh, and so uh, and then and, and with the Prussian forces coming in, too, that really tipped, tipped the balance of the whole battle. Uh, and so he was heavily outnumbered. And so what ends up happening is Napoleon, because of Waterloo, uh, is forced to abdicate the throne uh, a second time uh, a few days later. I think he tried to put his son on the throne. Uh, Napoleon II, they called him later. He was not really considered an official ruler. Uh, and so uh, the British wanted to get rid of Napoleon. And so they sent him to the Atlantic Ocean to an island called St. Helena. Uh, so that was something they really wanted to do uh, to get rid of Napoleon. By the way, there was a famous thing that happened later uh, after the battle. Uh, years later, the Belgians came back and put this monument there where uh, the battlefield is now. The Waterloo, which is, I think, mostly just a field 
of like green that's there. And uh, it's called the Lion's Mound. And it represented, I think, soldiers that died there, mostly Belgian soldiers that fought with the British. And uh, there's a story where um, supposedly uh, Wellington went there uh, to visit the site. Uh, and he was very angry about it because he said the whole thing messed up his view of the battlefield. <laughs> uh, and so, but anyway, but Waterloo, like I said, was the whole watershed of the whole, you know, Napoleonic Wars. And after that, Napoleon, you know, was pretty much finished. Yeah, that's the island that he was sent to, uh, St. Helena, uh, which is basically uh, off the coast of Africa. You can see it's not that far from where Angola is, uh, to kind of give you an idea. Uh, it's actually part of the British Empire, still to, or what's left of the British Empire today. And uh, he was sent there in 1815 and pretty much lived there uh, for five and a half years on the island until he died on May 5th, 1821. Uh, that was Napoleon's final house uh, where he lived uh, on, on uh, St. Helena. It's called Longwood, uh, which actually was a cattle barn they converted uh, into a house. Uh, and apparently he did not get along with his jailers. The British uh, refused to call him emperor. They would only call him general Bonaparte. Uh, and uh, I think the British constantly had ships that patrolled around the island because they were kind of concerned that Napoleon would, would leave again and try to take over France again. Uh, and so, but he would end up dying on that island. But Napoleon, uh, they say his biggest legacy really at the end of his life, uh, that's pretty important, was he wrote his memoirs uh, about his, you know, his life and uh, his campaigns as a general and ruler as an emperor. That helped to kind of really prove, you know, who really Napoleon was. And it kind of, it kind of redid his whole image uh, as, as a person. Uh, that's Napoleon on his deathbed. There's kind of been a debate about what killed Napoleon. Apparently, he died of stomach cancer, which his father had died of too. Uh, but there is a claim that Napoleon may have been poisoned with may, maybe arsenic, but they haven't really proved that uh, about that. That's his death mask, of course, on the right uh, in that image. Uh, also, uh, originally, they buried him on St. Helena. That's the original grave site of where he was buried initially when he died in 1821. Uh, but years later, uh, if you know about it, he was brought back to France uh, in, eight, I think around eight, what is it, 1840, I think was the year. Uh, and uh, he's now buried in Les in, 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 uh, in Paris, France today. And so Napoleon, you know, has become this great legacy, uh, you know, for the French. Uh, a lot of people kind of, you know, still see him as a great hero uh, of the French uh, overall. Uh, not just, you know, his military exploits, but uh, his nationalist influences, uh, his, you know, Napoleonic code, uh, things like that. And Napoleon really, uh, in the end, is this this modern man that a lot of, you know, rulers kind of copy later uh, in Europe. So he really he really changes Europe a lot, uh, Napoleon. Uh, and um Next week, I'm going to, well, really this week and into next week, we're, we're going to move on to talk more about the 19th century. I'll kind of talk about what happens with Russia and France, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars or something I'll kind of get into uh, and get to later uh, overall. But uh, before I go, like I said, I want to remind you about assignments uh, that are still out there. Uh, of course, the first exam, that's, of course, the main thing you'll need to kind of wrap up on uh, if you haven't done it yet. Uh, course, first exam, bonus quiz is still out. Second vocab, uh, that British quiz uh, from the Rise of the British Empire lectures, uh, that's still up. I think pretty much all those, like I said, I'm going to leave open during pretty much midterms uh, and all that. And y'all had any assignments missing, y'all should have got emails about assignments that are out there uh, that you can make up, of course, uh, during, of course, midterms, which I don't have a midterm course, you know, for midterm exams. So, you know, try to get whatever grades in, you know, at this point, because that's going to be your midterm grade, uh, of course, going into uh, afterwards. So that's it for the week. I'll see you all, of course, later in the week uh, to kind of continue talking about, you know, the 19th century. Uh, so y'all take care and have a great rest of the week.